It's great to be back with you again today. And we're continuing our series that we're calling Moving to a New Normal. Everybody is in a situation where they've learned that there are a lot of things that we normally do that just don't work. And we have to do something a little different. We've learned that we cannot depend upon ourselves. We have to have Christ in our life to make the difference. We, we learn that we cannot remember things, we cannot recall things, we cannot make good decisions unless we have the wisdom and the counsel of God in our life. And we talked last week about the idea of the fact that Jesus puts the Holy Spirit in us to be able to guide us and lead us. And so we need to go back to a, a, a new normal for us so that we're listening to Him. One of the things I want us to think about today is that idea of connecting to the power of prayer. Connecting to God through prayer. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, I, I enjoy a good conversation with somebody. But one of my problems is I talk too much in the conversation. Some of you may understand that type of thing and you know it, it could be that that my wife would ask me something like well what was your conversation about and and what do you know about that person and who are they married to and what are their children like and 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 all these types of things and I'm going uh-huh I never got there They know about me, but I don't know about them. It's not a conversation as such. It's an informational piece. And so many times in our prayer life, we're also that way. We go to God not to have a conversation with Him, but we go to God to tell Him things. He is our depository of information where we tell Him how much we need. We tell Him what we want. We tell Him about our family situations. We tell Him about our health concerns. We tell Him about our business problems. We tell, 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 tell. And we talk to God, not with God. And I want us to understand that the God we worship, the God we serve, the God we love wants a conversation with us. Not just to be talked to. He's got wisdom he wants to impart. He's got dreams he wants to instill. He's got so much that he wants to give us in that prayer connection, but we have to be connected. The passage that we're looking at is from Matthew chapter 5, or chapter 6, beginning at verse 5. It says, When you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in, the, in secret will reward you. And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words." So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Now, I want us to understand, this starts out when you pray. It assumes that we're going to pray. It assumes and puts into place the fact that you and I are going to be in that conversation with God. So he says, I want you to understand there's some things about this that I want to see. Now, I also want you to understand there's some things about this that we misinterpret sometimes. 
that I've heard some people say this is this is a, a very clear statement from Jesus that we're not supposed to pray in public that is not what this is about at all Jesus prayed in public if there was something wrong with praying in public Jesus wouldn't have done it if there was something wrong with praying in public Jesus wouldn't have encouraged us to do so at times so this is not a, say, a prayer say or teaching saying don't pray in public this is not something that's also saying you can't stand to pray I've heard some people that that will say this is about the position of prayer no this has nothing to do with the position of prayer as a matter of fact if we're going to take the Bible at its word and we're going to do what Paul says pray without ceasing if I'm going to pray without ceasing, that means I'm going to be praying while I'm laying in my bed. I'm going to be praying while I'm eating my breakfast. I'm going to be praying while I'm driving my car, riding the bus, or walking on to the MTR. I'm going to be praying while I'm working. I'm going to be praying in all kinds of positions. So it's not about the position of prayer. It's not about how I even pray. So, you know, here's what I want us to understand. This is about saying when we pray, where's our attitude? So, to connect to his power, first, I need to be real. He says, don't be a hypocrite. Now, a hypocrite, simply, in the Greek wording and the Greek idea, you have the actor any television actor is by Greek definition a hypocrite because they're playing a role they're playing a part that is not really them it is funny I remember one time uh, an actor talking about he was playing this role of this really macho guy and he said it's really tough because that's not me that's not who I am never been that bold never been that brazen but as a character, I can do that. And that's what it is. It's the act. And some people act a lot. Matter of fact, the other day, uh, I thought this is the perfect example for this particular point. I'm walking down the street, and this man is running up behind me. He has a cane in his hand, and he's running. <laughs> And he gets up around by me, and he, and he stops running, and he's fast walking with this cane. And I watch, and about a block away, he gets the cane down on the ground, and he's creeping. And in a little bit, he gets to the corner, and he kneels down really carefully, and he puts the cane out in front of him, shaking, and he starts begging. That's a hypocrite. That's someone playing a part that's not really who they are. Was the man an invalid? Not at all. He just ran past me. He played a good part. Now that's not saying all beggars are that way. There are people out there that really need our help. Listen to God and He'll prompt your heart on the ones that need your help and my help. But God says, do not come to me as a hypocrite. Don't come to me as a play actor. Don't come to me with the attitude of, oh Lord, here I am. You don't have to change your language to talk to God. You know, it's, isn't it funny how some people, they'll, they'll talk to you like this, and then when they talk to oh God, I am so pleased to bring you this report of how wonderful I am. God knows your heart. God knows your motivation. He knows my heart and my motivation. And God is just saying, get real. Pour out your heart before me. Walk in a way where you want to be with me. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 27, he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they are full of dead men's bones and all sorts of uncleanness. And then, think about this. 
we need to recognize who we are before God like Ezra did. Listen to what Ezra says. Ezra chapter 9 verse 6. And I said, oh my God, I am ashamed and embarrassed to lift up my face to you, my God, for our iniquities have risen above our heads and our guilt has grown even to the heavens. But you know what? There's a wonderful thing that the Bible talks about. It says, if I agree with God about me, God does some amazing things. Listen, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess, and that word confess is a Greek word that is made of two words that says to say the same as. So when God says, Butch Tanner, you're a sinner, I agree, I'm a sinner. When God says that I failed, I agree, I failed. When God says those things, I am in agreement. It says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We come before God in confession. Lord, I've ignored you. Lord, I've been boss. Lord, I made decisions today that were completely my own. About my wife, about my family, about my job. God, I need to confess to you that I have not put you as number one in my life. Let's just get real. Let's stop acting like we've done an amazingly good job because we've got a God who says He will forgive. Listen to how David responds in Psalm 51 verse 4. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. One day I was driving down the road and I was pulled over by a traffic officer. This was in the U.S. and the officer gave me a ticket. And my friend in the car said, why didn't you tell him that you were going the right speed? Why didn't you fight him giving you the ticket? Why didn't you do that? I said, because I've done it probably enough times that I didn't get caught that I deserved it. It's a reminder. We need to understand that we need to put ourselves in a place that we understand when God makes a decision, a judgment. He's not making it from any other place than verified truth about who we are. So let's get real with Him in our prayer life. Another thing I want us to see here, it says, to connect to His power, I need to make God my audience. You see, we can sometimes in our prayers make others our audience. We can sometimes make ourselves our audience. We can sometimes make God our audience. And we want to make sure it's God. We, we see the Pharisees standing on the street corner. And, and here, when, it, it, when it's talking about in this passage, they love to stand in the synagogues and on the street corners. It's interesting, in this particular passage, when it uses the word street here, it's not talking about another word that is more commonly used as street. Normally, it's the little narrow street is what is talked about. But this particular word is talking about the wide street. So what would happen is the Pharisee would have to pray. If he's going to be a, a, a good Pharisee, he has to pray three times a day. And you know what he would do? He would make sure that he was near a busy street corner 
if he wanted to be seen by people. Make sure he was near a busy street corner when that time came because wherever he is at the moment, he has to stop and pray. And you know what? The reality is most of the time his prayer was just rote memory. It is interesting that this prohibition of these types of things comes right before the Lord teaches us how to pray, which is the most repeated, faultless prayer of most Christians around the world. And, and, and you know, it's not that it's wrong to repeat it. It's not that it's wrong to say it. It's not that it's wrong to say it publicly. Sometimes it's just our heart. So, sometimes our heart is just that we're saying it. These guys would repeat these prayers that were written down, that they had memorized, and they're just saying it so that others can hear it. If your prayer is one that you're concerned about what are other people going to think more than what God is going to think, then that's a sign your prayers are to others. Another example that he gives <clears throat> is that Pharisees are, are people sometimes pray to themselves. You remember the guy who was praying in the temple and looking at the sinner over in the distance and saying, God, I'm glad I'm not like him. God, in case you don't know, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I've not done this, and I've not done that, 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 and, done that, and I'm a really good person. You know what the Bible tells us about that particular prayer? It says the man is doing nothing but praying to himself. When you're glorifying yourself in your prayer, you become the audience of that prayer. And I need to be cautious that my prayer isn't for others to hear only and that my prayer isn't for me, but it's for God. I need to have Him as my focus. When Nehemiah heard about Jerusalem and the walls, destruction, and the needs that were there, it says in the Bible that he went before the God of heaven and he mourned and he cried and he spoke words for days. God was his audience. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 9, it says, Then David the king went in and sat before the Lord, and he said, Who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house that you have brought me this far? God is his audience. Later, <clears throat> in Psalm chapter 3, or five, 5, verse 3, it says, In the morning, O Lord, you will hear my voice. In the morning, I will order my prayer to you and eagerly watch. God needs to be our audience. Now again, remember, it's not a prohibition of public prayer, but it is a prohibition of public prayer where others are your audience. It is a prohibition of public prayer where you and I personally become the audience. God is to always be the audience in our prayer. The third thing I want us to see is to connect to His power. I need to speak clearly from the heart. And notice it's saying, don't use meaningless repetition... Now, we know that God's not saying don't be repetitive with your prayer because he actually praises several different scenarios in the Gospels where there's repetition of honest prayer. But it is interesting that this word that is used is the same word from the root of the idea of the person who just stutters. You ever been around somebody that stutters? Sometimes they start words and, and, and words make sense when they start and then all of a sudden they get into and you're going, okay, I'm with you. I'll hang on there until you can break the cycle. 
And then we can get some understanding about this. Well, in the culture of the day, the idea was, because there's literally hundreds of thousands of gods, similar to the way there are here, and, and, you, and you get this idea of you're trying to get God's attention. So what do you do? You use repetitive sounds and repetitive ideas. It's almost like if I can, if I can hit the right note, if I can say the right thing, if I can get the right combination of sounds, then it produces this magical event that happens that causes this God to wake up and causes this God to move to action based on the request that I have. That's the background that Jesus is looking at this from, and he's saying, look, you cannot make your prayers like this. They can't be that meaningless, repetitive action. Remember, God says, I'm not just concerned about your many words. I'm concerned about your heart. I want to know your heart in the middle of all of this. I want your genuine request to be made known to me. You don't have to get my attention. When Elijah was facing the prophets of Baal. Elijah would push the prophets. He would say, maybe he's not answering because he's asleep. Maybe he's not answering because he went on a journey. Maybe he's not answering because he's gone to the toilet. You go back and read the passage and that's exactly what it says. Maybe you need to do more. Maybe you get, need, to, need to do more things. Maybe you need to cut yourself more. Maybe you need to be involved more. And he's, he's badgering them on so that they can wake up their God. Isn't it amazing that our God says, I will be with you always. I will never f forsake you. I will never be in a situation where I'm not with you. So in your prayer, my prayer, when we pray from a position of trust and understanding of who God is, He's with us. We don't have to wake Him up. We don't have to get His attention. He's there with us, right there. In Psalm 62, verse 8, it says, Trust in Him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him God is our refuge for us trust him in Psalm 139 verse 23 it says search me O God and know my heart try me and know my anxious thoughts but I also know that there are times in our life where we are dealing with struggles that are so deep, hurts that are so powerful, problems that we are so below even understanding what is going on in the problem that we don't know how to pray. But you know what God says? He says, come to me. Pour out your heart in those moments. Sometimes you can just go to God and say, God, this problem is so much bigger than I understand. I don't even know what to do. I'm coming before you in an attitude of prayer, just asking you to talk with me about it. Give me understanding. Give me wisdom. Give me direction. Because I don't know what to do. And you know what? Remember last week we talked about the Holy Spirit and its role? Or his role? Listen to what Romans chapter 8, verse 26 and 27 confirm for us in relationship to prayer. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for, our, for words. And he searches the hearts he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is 
because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Powerful. The last thing I want us to see is to connect to his power. I need to trust in his response. You, <clears throat> you remember earlier, uh, one of the passages, let's see, in the Psalm 5 passage, I'll just repeat that verse. You've already seen it. It says, In the morning, O Lord, you will hear my voice. In the morning, I will order my prayer to you and eagerly watch. What was David saying there? He's saying, I am watching for God's response. When you and I pray, we need to watch for God's response. We need to trust that God is going to respond. Now, people will ask me sometimes, how does God answer prayer? I'll say, sometimes yes, sometimes no. And there's a lot of times as Christians, we will say a no answer is an un unanswered prayer. A no answer is not an unanswered prayer. Sometimes God will tell us, maybe later. You're not quite spiritually mature enough to handle this next step. You're not, you've not gone through enough struggles to grow the strength and faith that you need. So maybe, yes, later. Sometimes God just says, wait. Oh, those are tough times. Those are tough times. Goodness. Do you know in the book of Job... Job wants answers from God. He really does. He asks for answers from God. And you know what? He doesn't get them. Through the entire book, God never answers Job. But what God does do is he allows Job to encounter him in a way Job had never encountered God. Jesus himself at Gethsemane prays three different times, Lord, if you can, take this cup away. But ultimately, he always comes back to the same thing, not my will, but yours. Paul has what he refers to as the thorn in the flesh. And people have speculated as to what that is tons of times and I think the reason why the Bible never answers that question is because if it did we would automatically say well I'm glad I don't have that one the thorn in the flesh he prayed for God to take it away and you know what God said no I'm gonna let you deal with that heartbreak I'm gonna let you deal with that 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 pain I'm gonna let you walk through the rest of your life feeling the pressure from that thorn in the flesh but I'm also gonna do something else I'm gonna give you comfort in the midst of all of those struggles and I'm gonna give you grace to understand that all of that is forgiven and all of that is taken care of. But I'm going to have to help have you understand that I'm not walking you out of this issue. I'm going to walk with you in this issue. And we're going to go through it together. Sometimes when we're in the middle of a prayer time and we have those types of answers, we kind of go, God, that's not what I wanted. And that's when we say, God just didn't answer my prayer. We have to trust Him. We have to trust Him. Because there have been so many times in my life that God has answered a prayer instantaneously. And there have been so many times in my life God has said, you're not mature enough. And there's been other times when God has said, you got to wait. And in all those times, I have to trust the Lord. Ultimately, God is going to give me through the prayers those things 
that are most beneficial to me at that point in my walk with him. And he's going to do the same thing for you. Trust him. In Isaiah chapter 12, verse 2, it says, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and song and has become my salvation. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 says, This is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And see, a lot of times we ask him for things, but we don't know if it's according to his will or not because we don't have the heart of God in tune with our life. And that's what we need. Psalm 34, verse 4, I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. And lastly, 1 John chapter 3, verse 22, And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments, and we do the things that are pleasing in His sight. We need to be a people who move to a place of prayer. It is very common, unfortunately, that most Christians spend about 10 minutes or less with God in prayer a day. Can't build a relationship that way. Can't get wisdom that way. So in our new normal, we want to ask God to change us, that we are people who pray without ceasing. This morning, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I want to ask you, your first prayer to Him needs to be, Lord, I want to just give up my life to you. And I want you to come in and take over all that I am and be my guide, be my strength, be my salvation. This morning, would you just say that? For those of us who are Christians, we just ask God to drive us to that connection in prayer. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we want to thank you for your love for us and your guidance in our life. We just ask that you forgive us when our prayers are meaningless words and trite phrases. Forgive us when we're more interested in how others are impressed by what we say than really even tuning our hearts into what you want. Forgive us when we fail to meet you in thoughtful, personal, ongoing conversation throughout the day. Lord, I just wonder, how is it that we can talk to so many others freely about our concerns and our fears, our desires, our dreams and hopes and struggles, and leave you out? Forgive us. Today, Lord, I want to start new at a different level in our relationship. I want to be in close, constant conversation with you. I want to hear from you clearly. I desire to know your heart. I want to re receive your instruction. And I want to follow you without question or hesitation. Grow in me a heart that longs to be with you. And Lord, make my life a life that glorifies you. And Lord, I know that there are many in our congregation that are either here physically or listening that want the same thing. Lord, we want constant conversation with you to be our new normal. In the name of Jesus, we pray.